Hello, everybody, and welcome to the George Washington University. I'm Frank Sesno, and climate. Um, climate has been making a lot of news lately, a lot of news. The climate story is changing, and the coverage of climate is changing, and that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, from cable news to major newspapers, from public media to podcasting, how is the coverage of climate change adjusting to meet the times? How are the news media adapting? Are they getting the story right? How is the audience responding? So what do we learn from all of that? There's a lot going on, and there's a lot of new ideas, imagination, and new coverage. And that's what we're going to explore, especially in 2020, this political year. It couldn't be more timely. So as I mentioned, I'm Frank Sesno. I'm the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs. I started a project here called Planet Forward some years ago, where we invite students from all over the country, all over the world, to tell the stories as they see them, of those ideas and innovations needed to move the planet forward, given the many challenges that we now confront. Um, climate Forward and um, or cli Planet Forward and Climate Nexus have assembled a really amazing group of journalists, communicators, storytellers, and experts in climate change who will talk to us today uh, about all this. How the climate uh, coverage in the media is changing. Why? With what effects, as I said, uh, with what results from the audience. As I mentioned, today's discussion is a joint presentation, so a little background. Climate Nexus is dedicated to changing the conversation on climate change and, and clean energy. Climate Nexus works with media, nonprofits, business leaders, policymakers, sort of the whole range to elevate the science, to highlight the stories, to create and craft the narratives, supporting those um, who've been most impacted, will be most impacted um, by climate change, and to really figure out ways to make this a, a, a really compelling story that people know and listen to and, and remember. Planet Forward, which is a project of the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs here, um, is an environmental storytelling platform for college students. It's focused on the ideas and innovations to move the planet forward. That's sort of the point, right? The mission is to launch the next generation, new generations of environmental leaders and communicators. And as we say, if you're a good communicator, if you're a great storyteller, you'll be more successful at just about anything you do. So whether you're a scientist or a business leader or in the public sector or in the private sector, you'll just do better when you communicate well and effectively. At Planet Forward's annual summit, we gather every year in April with students and storytellers and leaders in business and NGOs and, 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 and environment and climate science. We um, stated up front that the national dialogue on climate change was shifting, that we see big changes and we hear big changes in the stories and the characters and the people who are engaged in this. Students from around the world and from around the country, when they posted their stories at planetforward.org, made that clear because their narratives are changing. Our topic, our focus area at the summit, was stories with impact. Stories with impact. How do they affect public opinion? How do they affect policy? How do they affect the decisions that we need to make? It drove home the point that the media and the audience were looking for new narratives. And why? Well, because the world is changing, because climate change itself is a more urgent issue. And it is changing fast. Science and politics colliding all over the place with extreme weather events and public opinion. So we started our event with a little video that we edited. I'm going to give you just a sense of the open of that video, which shows sort of why we're here today and what we're talking about and why it is as urgent as it is. Here you go. Raging wildfires in California. The most destructive and deadliest fire in state history. Well, it is now a Category 4 storm. The Panhandle of Florida has never, ever experienced a storm like this. A new report by the UN carries a stark warning. Experts say that we have until 2030 to avoid catastrophe. Brand new report on climate change released by the Trump administration. It paints a dire picture warning that the Earth's climate is changing rapidly. I've seen it. Uh, I've read some of it and it's fine. I don't believe it. Wow. So, as I said, a collision. This is not about politics. This is about climate. So I'd like now to ask our esteemed panel, our amazing panel, to join me here up on stage. So come on up.
group. <laughs> Step up. <laughs> Everybody okay? I'll get yeah. it next. Okay. I was literally planning to not do that. All right, so welcome everybody. Let me introduce our panelists. Um, I'm sure many of them you know, some of them you know have seen. Jeff Berardelli, he's the meteorologist and climate specialist for CBS News. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for being here, it's awesome. I'm gonna let you explain the colors on your chest in just a okay. moment. <laughs> um, Eugenia Harvey, she's executive producer with Peril and Promise, WMNET. What's Peril and Promise? It is stories of climate change. Only climate change? That's right. To a digital audience, television we audience, radio for, audience, who is it? We are digital first, uh -huh. but we are all, we're public media, mm -hmm. so we are actually all platforms. We are film, we are television, we are radio, and we are digital. Great. <laughs> and Jen Christensen, cl your climate and health uh, reporter mm -hmm. and producer, reporter and producer, the whole thing? Reporter for uh, digital and producer for television. Okay, with mm -hmm. CNN. With CNN. I know CNN, I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> you may have some I worked there once. Uh, <laughs> and so what is your focus? So my focus is specifically <coughs> on health and the intersection of health and climate. Health and climate. So mm -hmm. how much is health and how much is climate, or are, are those stories all put together? Every week that? we get to do a little bit of everything. So you do weekly stories? Mm -hmm. Okay. Daily, actually. Daily stories mm -hmm. online? Daily stories online? Online. On TV, it depends on the news cycle. So what we're going to discuss here is what you all are doing, how that has changed, how your news organization has changed, how your... Um, and, and very importantly, how the audience is responding, because ultimately we lead, but we also follow audiences, right? Okay. Um, Jeff, I want to start with you, and but I want to start with a clip okay. of you on set, so we'll see what you're doing. No, you know what? I, I want to start with the colors, all right? Oh, a lot okay. of people know that. I said, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, so how many of you have actually seen these, these colors before? So it's, okay, so it's a little bit more than 50% of the folks out there. So a uh, climate scientist named Ed Hawkins from the University of Reading in uh, the UK um, actually designed these stripes about, I'd say, two years ago. And basically it shows temperatures from 1850 to 2019. And uh, it uses blue to show the coldest years and red to show the warmest years. It's really simple visual, and that's the point behind communication, right? Uh, science can sometimes get a little gray, a little cloudy for people. We want to make it as simple as possible. Looking at this visual makes it just really easy for people to see um, what's happening with the Earth's climate. It went from cold, now it's warm. Uh, about two years ago, I asked meteorologists from all over the Earth to, to wear ties. I, I, I designed some ties and I designed some coffee mugs and some pins. You're and into all kinds of earrings things. Earrings. <laughs> I don't know. I just got, I don't know what happened. <laughs> and and I, just, well, I, just, I just realized it was a good way to communicate. And it was very successful. We had hundreds of meteorologists from all over the world wearing it. And to be honest with you, ever since then, people have been doing it, using the, the, uh, the visual themselves. Somebody wrapped their Tesla in it. I saw an art oh, wow. exhibit in, in Berlin, this great art exhibit in, in Berlin. Uh, it's popping up everywhere. The, uh, House, uh, the um, House Select uh, Committee on Climate Change, yes, yes, yes. it's their logo. And a bunch of senators and congressmen were wearing it during the State of the and Union. The House Select Committee, by the way, is actually yeah. a bipartisan committee. There are Republicans yeah. on that committee as well as Democrats. So if they're all embracing that, it's, a, it's an important uh, mm -hmm. visualization of the science, right? It's right. a visualization of the science. All right. So I, I, what I want to do is roll in a quick clip here where you see Jeff on set doing what he does, which is to explain. So, And we're, we're going to hear the meteorologist's story, your journey, in just a minute. But take a look at Jeff in action. So the pattern is naturally occurring, right. but climate change could make it more intense? Right. So there, first of all, there's a study out that climate change is making this natural pattern worse and more extreme. But in addition to that, we're seeing gradual trends take place over the past century or so, and a couple of those are this. So first of all, the number of extreme heat days. Take a look at this. In 1910, 1920, almost zero extreme heat days, and now we're up to an average of around 15. That really dries out the soil. You can imagine the amount of heat. In addition, the gradual increase in temperature, both of the ocean and also of the atmosphere, has gone up. In fact, the air has gone up around 3 degrees Fahrenheit over 100 years. Again, that gradually dries out the brush. Lastly, fire danger in the southeast corner, especially of Australia. Look at how much it's gone up over the past four decades or so. So this is a situation where climate change is kind of the background. When you have a natural pattern that's causing extreme fire danger, climate change spikes it, it enhances it, it turns extreme fire danger into catastrophic fire danger. 
Jeff, what you're doing here, you're sort of the climate change explainer in chief. You're not the meteorologist, but you're sort of the analyst. I'm both. What's no, I'm both. So my undergrad degree is, is, is meteorology and atmosphere. But you're not science. doing the weather forecast here the way we do. But I do weather forecast sometimes. So it just depends <laughs> upon my role on that given day. But that was the point is to try to merge meteorology with climate change because I think that meteorologists are one of the most effective communicators. We're a trusted source of science information for our uh, viewers. Um, I think that it's a natural progression for TV meteorologists to be doing this at a time when TV meteorologists are becoming, in some cases, a little bit more obsolete because you can get the weather forecast on your app. Anytime. So, so it's important for meteorologists to kind of take that next step in their careers. And the natural way to make the world a better place, by the way, because it's necessary and needed right now, is to educate people on climate change, which is within their purview. This is within their expertise. Jeff, I want to yeah. sure. read from a, a, a piece you wrote in 2019 explaining your own personal journey. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you wrote, from 2007 to 2018, I worked as a TV meteorologist in South Florida. In this capacity, I was keenly aware that humans had become a force of nature, spewing heat, trapping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, warming the planet, melting ice and swelling seas. Surrounding me, though, you wrote, in my life and work, evidence piled up that human-caused climate change was entering overdrive. Yet at the same time, public concern was lukewarm at best, my, and my business, the media, were basically ignoring what was becoming one of the most important stories of all time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you did something about it. Yeah, so I quit my job. Uh, I, was a chief, I, was a chief, I was a chief meteorologist. In, in protest? In no, I in just a huff? Uh, not at all. No, no. Sadly, <laughs> no, not sadly either. Okay. No, none, of, none of those things. No, I um, I just thought it was the right thing to do. I just thought it was the right thing to do, and I also knew I have a weird um, talent. I figure out the answers to problems. I'm a problem solver, so I thought, let me just go to New York. Let me figure out how to get the networks to do more climate change coverage. But in order to do that, I needed to. I, th I thought at least get another degree, so I got a master's degree. I'm getting it, actually, I have half a class left at Columbia University uh, in climate change because I wanted to have that solid foundation uh, of Science. climate. Although I will tell you that a lot of my knowledge in climate came from my first degree, my, my atmospheric sciences degree. Um, and I also had some experience at CBS in my past, so I thought I could probably you figure out. go into CBS and say, hey, I want to be your client. Something like that. Thing. It was a little more difficult, and but did something like that. you have to like twist that. their arms? Uh, I just made myself extraordinarily available when they needed me. <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning, Jeff, we have an emergency. Our weather person today has got a cold. All right, I'll be there. I mean, I'm exaggerating in that way, but, but not really. Um, I just was very strategic about the way that I did it. But, but I also knew that CBS was kind of a middle-of-the-road source of, of media information, right? They weren't r far right or far left. They were in the middle, and if we're going to convince people in America that climate change is really important. We need, I think, a media source that doesn't come off as either way, straight down the middle. So I targeted CBS specifically. You targeted CBS. But I had worked at CBS before. I had context there. It all kind of made sense to try to bring everything that I brought to the table together there. And somehow, some way, miraculously, it, it worked out. We're going to come back and talk about how you tell your stories and how you connect. But Jen Christensen, let me turn to you. CNN, I know CNN well. CNN is the hard news place. Okay. Sure. Um, and I have a, a <laughs> picture I want to put up. Um, CNN has made a very look at them all. Hmm? Look at them all. <laughs> Aren't they adorable? Um, we miss them. <laughs> really? No. Uh, okay. But CNN did something remarkable, uh, and I, I, I talked to some of the senior executives at CNN. They said we are going to put a stake in the ground, a much bigger stake in the ground on on climate change. And we're not just going to call it climate change. We're going to refer to a climate crisis. And you did a series of town presidential town halls. How many hours? Uh, seven. Seven hours. In the end. Seven hours. And you've and Bill Weir has become your climate mm -hmm. correspondent. You are doing some of this now as well. Why did CNN take such a strong and demonstrable turn? What triggered that into this climate story? I think much like the climate crisis, it was a slow moving moment, right? So it's this disaster that moves slowly, but is so involved in so many different topics. So I think that the people who make the decisions uh, finally started hearing how tragic this could become. 
but also how many opportunities there were. What do, you, what do you mean the people who make the st decisions finally started hearing how tragic this could be? I think that they started to see the hurricanes every year. They started to see the intensity of the weather events. And then they started to see that this was going to impact the GDP, what, 10 percent? If the worst thing happened. So it wasn't the science, it was sort of, it was the extreme weather, it was sort of the disaster story. I think it's will, a disaster, but I think it's also the economics. I think it's the science itself. I think it's the politics. It delves into so many different subject areas that are so important. Plus, we know that our voters care. Deeply. So how is the climate beat at CNN now organized? So we have a head of unit uh, who is a meteorologist, uh, Brandon, who's fantastic. Um, we have Bill Weir, who's on air. Um, we have then, it's the, um, the uh, what do we call it, the troops of the willing. So I uh, am covering uh, coronavirus most of the time at the <laughs> moment. Um, but I, I wish you told me that before you <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. Thankfully, uh, it's uh, not in, in me yet. Um, but uh, so hands-on coverage. Yes, so. yes. But on the plane on the way here, um, I was working on what were the climate studies for next week. So we could take a look at what, what cover, cutting average coverage should we be paying attention to mm -hmm. for next week. Mm -hmm. So this is, for me, something I fit in in between everything else. Um, we have others at the company who are working specifically on this, like Bill. Um, but there are a lot of us who care deeply about this topic and know that it touches on so many areas that matter so much to our audience. Uh, well, that matters so much to your audience. I happen to know that ratings matter to your bosses. Sure. Does the climate story rate? Depends. On? If it's a big disaster, that does really well. Right? Yeah. Um, if it's something about uh, fact checking, that's what I get to do for all the debates. That's why I miss all those people. Um, <laughs> it was fun. Um, but uh, that, does, that does okay. That does okay. But, but people do hear it and people do come to it. It's one of those topics for digital for us that people come to. And it's not just younger people, although younger people do seem to really like this topic, but older people <coughs> are starting to pay attention to it differently. We've seen How in the last few years. How do you know that? How do you know that? Based on clicks. Based, based on, on how many clicks. clicks we have. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Eugenia Harvey, um, Peril and Promise. Mm -hmm. um, what is the frequency of, of your reporting? How much reporting does, does Peril and Promise do, and where will people see that? All day, every day. We're on uh, pbs.org. Um, slash peril and promise, um, but we have uh, new content up every day. Some we aggregate, we partner with um, Columbia University, NYU, we have a, a battalion of uh, climate scientists who give us content and work with us. Um, and we are consistently creating content, or again, we're aggregating it uh, really every day. This is my full-time job. Um, and what are you seeing with the audience mm -hmm. response? Because in the world of digital, right, you know exactly where people are going mm -hmm. and well, how they're bouncing around and all of that. Yeah. So if I can, if I can answer the question that you asked them, which is the the network's commitment to yeah. it, um, we began Parallel and Promise in 2017 because we're public television. It was due to viewers like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I had to do that. That's My boss is going to. They'll all write a check to you before you <laughs> leave. I like it. <laughs> you say that in your sleep, don't I you? Do, <laughs> I do. I really do. <laughs> um, but um, but but you know the need was absolutely there. Our viewers were very interested in it, and so we started um, Peril and Promise. We we had a funder who was also interested and committed because of his grandchildren. And That's really interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. His grandchildren helped him to see that you know they did not have a future hmm. on this planet. So Grandpa. You know, <laughs> and, uh, check, yeah. and 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 he is now reaching millions of people. It is now reaching millions of people, and so um, to to look at uh, the audience and, and how we are building, um, what I what I can tell you is that um, we did a four part series uh, a year or so ago, um, Sinking Cities. It was four hours where we looked at New York, um, uh, um, Miami, Tokyo, and London, and it is the second highest rated um, story series that we have done. So the, the on PBS across in, the in board? This, in this time period, yes, across the board. We beat out online, Animal Babies. Online and TV? Or yeah, it, well, it, it aired, it aired um, no, no, it aired on television. Wait, you beat out Animal Babies? Yes, we beat out. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, saying a lot. That is saying a lot. Well, I have a tra <laughs> we have a little trailer, a clip of, 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 the, of your, one of your shows. It's not Animal Babies. <laughs> but but I, but I want to roll that and then talk to you about um, what you're trying to do here. So let's take a look. How does our warming planet impact Americans in our day-to-day -day lives? 
We went on a bus tour across the South and Southwest to find out. We are fighting for a life. We're fighting to survive. The Freedom to Breathe tour was our attempt to understand how climate change is overlapping with the racial, social, and economic challenges facing Americans. We're in the South. We're in the Gulf Coast, the most environmentally befouled region of the country. And it's also one of the most vulnerable, climate vulnerable region of the country. Our goal was to see for ourselves how fossil fuel pollution and climate change touch people's lives through public health, housing, the environment, and the economy. Freedom to breathe. That's what we need here on the Gulf Coast. That's what we need on the West Coast. That's what we need on the East Coast. We all should have freedom to breathe. Now this was a Climate Nexus yes, collaboration. So collaboration. Climate Nexus is helping us put on this conversation here today. So talk about how you worked with Climate Nexus, what their role was. They were incredible. They, they I actually at a, at a conference not terribly unlike this, I met uh, uh, Philip Berger from uh, from Climate Nexus, and he invited us to go to their offices. And they said, "Well, you know, we did this bus tour," and the producer in me said, "Did you film it?" <laughs> and, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, you take a look at what we have." Not, not Philip, but his part, his, his teammates. And they said, "Yeah, take a look at what we had." And I said, "Could we edit that <laughs> and put together a story?" And so we did. And so we were able to to really collaborate. They had done the absolute, you know, ninety five percent of the heavy lifting mm -hmm. in finding these stories and and finding these wonderful people who populated so it. So now talk about what we just saw. I, I will say this: mm -hmm. when our work uh, here at George. Washington University mm -hmm. and with all the colleges and universities that are part of our Planet Forward consortium and the schools that participate. A theme that comes up among students and young people yeah. again and again and again is climate equity, is yeah. environmental justice, yeah. is engaging a larger conversation, which is clearly what you're trying to do here. Yeah. So talk about that and, and how and why. Well, the appeal of that story was that <laughs> I saw you know, brown and black faces who never are talked to in these stories in a lot of traditional stories, right, about the media. And they are absolutely affected on a, on a f not just on a greater level, but first. So they are the front line of climate change. And Why do you say that, for people who may not be aware? They don't have, the, they very often don't have the money, they don't have, they have the resources, they live in these areas that have been historically um, in climate vulnerable areas on the shores. They're on the on the edges of, of, of uh, farmland areas that are that are affected tremendously by them. They have lower wage paying jobs. They're seeing those be affected, and so in order to tell their story, in order to to look at it, because one of the things that we really focus on at Peril and Promise are the human stories. You know, yes, we do our share of weather porn. We absolutely do. Weather porn. <laughs> yes, we do. We because you you, you cannot you get heard to it the here, folks, <laughs> first, <laughs> you right? cannot get to the promise without looking at the peril. And our audiences, you know, I'm sorry, they say, you know, everybody says we want to see the solutions, and they do. But you, if we were to do a show that was entirely based on solutions, we get no viewership, right? But when we show them, look at this. We're having we have people who are who are who are literally drowning. Or we have people who are being burned out of their homes. Or we have uh, a situation, for example, in Chicago. We just, we just um, supported a documentary about the hottest days in Chicago in 1985, Cooked, you know, where nice. climate change, it was an incredible documentary, right? And um, where they were literally burning to death in their homes. These are poor people. They are 85 to 95 percent black and brown. And so let's stay with this for a minute, and then I want to open the conversation up here on, on, on this sort of notion of how mm -hmm. the, the, the climate story is framed. <clears throat> when you are doing a story about black and brown and underserved people and their mm -hmm. vulnerability, is the story about them mm -hmm. or is the story for them? Who is your intended audience? What are you trying to do with these stories besides just tell a great story? Right, 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 right. Honestly, the audience is who we're trying to reach. Now the PBS audience, I'm a little biased, and you know I come out of commercial television. <laughs> um, I come out of PBS, PBS, of course, but CNN and, and ABC and CBS. I've done time at all the networks. <laughs> You've um, done time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but uh, but the PBS audience is a little bit more informed, a little bit more engaged, and we definitely see that on our on our digital sites, right? So I want them to know that these are human beings. 
right? So there, there are human beings who are facing <coughs> these issues, whose lives are in jeopardy, and, 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 it, and it's happening to them now, but it is going to happen to you. Right? So, so let me open the conversation with, with the two of you, and let's, let's, let's take this one for a moment. Mm -hmm. How do you, or do you, try to make the story of climate change a more inclusive conversation? How do you tell stories about a more diverse audience, and how do you tell stories for a more diver diverse audience? Because those are two different things, right? Especially now, when <laughs> we talk less about broadcasting, we talk about narrow casting, very niche audiences, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. Well, I mean, I think it has to be pertinent to people's lives. So, and what I mean by that is, if you're going to do a story and you know you can't focus on, well, climate change is going to cause this by 2100 because people don't pay attention to that, but they will pay attention to a mortgage cycle. Mm -hmm. So if you can show them what kind of impacts they're going to have or already having within their mortgage cycle or within their lives or, or their children's lives, once you get past grandchildren, it becomes a little bit more uh, obtuse. It's not, it's not as direct. So I would say it's got to be stuff that, that's real. We did a story, CBS News, on how people are losing, out, uh, losing their insurance in California because of the fires there. That's a real story. People have half of their life, life's worth invested in their homes. What happens when they cannot get insurance anymore? Or they can't afford insurance because it's 10 times or 15 times higher than it was before. Once you don't have insurance for a home or you can't get insurance for a home or it's that expensive, no one's going to buy your home. So how much is your home really worth then? You know, you've lost a lot of your life savings. So that's a good story because it, it connects to everybody because everyone cares about money, unfortunately, you know, but that's, that's the reality. So I would say it's got to be uh, stories that people can feel are pertinent to them. And it's going to be different for everybody, right? It's going to be for libertarians and, 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 cons and conservatives. It may be more based on the economy. Um, and, and for liberals, it may be more based on uh, climate justice. So all those stories need to be told. How do you expand the audience and the, and the, and the story? Well, if working in health, um, often when we talk about uh, uh, minorities that are disproportionately impacted by health issues, so asthma and the African-American community, um, it's, it's a hard sell to get that story <coughs> on air or uh, in digital because people say, yeah, we know that, of course. Mm -hmm. It's terrible, we know that. And so with this climate crisis though, now we have another layer and people are starting to pay attention. So for me, it's been wonderful because these issues that I care deeply about, these social justice issues, I can talk about now because people care about the climate. So uh, let me, let me <clears throat> put this one to all three of you. A few, several years ago, many years ago, when I was at CNN, I, did a, I proposed a documentary, an energy documentary. And it was greenlit, as we say in the business. The executive producer said, yes, go for it, we love this. So I put it all together, but just before I, got tr I started traveling, the phone rang and said, well, wait a minute, we're putting this on hold. Because another pr executive producer um, said, there's nothing new here. Hmm. There's nothing new here. Mm -hmm. And I said, whoa, sure. yes, there is. And then they said, well, there's not much story here. Mm -hmm. And so we went tussled back and forth, and we finally got it on the air. D are, do you have battles? Do you have hard-fought pitches about how to get your climate coverage on the air? Are you asked, what's new here? Because, okay, I've been hearing uh, that it's hotter and that people are suffering and the prices are going to go up. So mm -hmm. how do you, how, two questions. How hard is it to get this stuff on the air? And how hard is it to find something quote unquote new or do you not even need to do that? I, I, I want to answer that because, <clears throat> because we are fortunate enough to deal in multi-platforms, right? Mm -hmm. I can always find an audience. So if my higher ups at PBS say, we don't want to do another documentary on climate change, I can do digital first, or I can <coughs> go to public media, I can go to radio, or I can you know, do, go to a podcast person if it's a really great story. So I have multiple platforms, which I'm sure you guys are having, you, you experience that as well. Everybody's multi-platform now, right? But, um, but sometimes there is a push, you know, it's what else can we do? I was just, you know, back to the Sinking Cities being the number two rated, um, you know, uh, series uh, in, in, in PBS for 18 and 19, that gave us a real wind, 
mm-hmm. underneath our wings, yeah. right? Yeah. Because I can go back to my, um, you know, the the head of programming and say, hey, you know, we we beat baby animals. We can we should be able to do. <laughs> some, well, but it didn't sound right. right. <laughs> it didn't sound right. It did not sound right. We did not we did not beat baby animals. Our ratings were higher there than. We <laughs> there we go. Thank you. <laughs> than those of it went out on Twitter. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you know, we, we can we have some momentum, you know, by being able to go back and say that. So maybe, just maybe, hopefully, there will be some some growth in that area. Mm-hmm. So you know, you you get some successes, and you have to build on those. Are you those. following the audience or leading the audience? We do both. Are we you following the audience or leading the audience. I think leading the audience because honestly, a lot of the stories we do, we're not basing off of viewer feedback. We're just doing it because we think it's a good visual. Mm-hmm story usually visual is what carries our stories if, oh. if if they make the grade if they make cbs this morning or or especially the evening news um we will do a lot more stuff for our digital platform as you can imagine it's a lot easier to do ratings stuff, a lot are part time. of your conversation are they not they are part of the conversation and i think it's not just ratings but if you want to retain or grab younger viewers Climate change is one way to do it, and our research apparently shows that, although that's above my pay grade. I wasn't allowed to see that research yet. I'm going to see if I can get my hands on it, though. <laughs> but the point is I've heard through the grapevine rumors that, uh, that younger people, you know, well, our when research I, when shows I was at CBS seen. not so long ago and talking to some executives there, they said flat out, CBS Evening News has an older demographic. It's the more traditional, right. more rural demographic. CBSN, your online uh, new source and we're doing uh, a lot of climate much younger demographic and does a lot of climate so change. I'll tell you it's 58 years old is our average viewer or so um, on television I'm get somewhere in the late and high 50s and uh, 37 or so for CBSN so we can do a lot more climate change but it's not just uh, the age of the viewers it's also the fact that we uh, we're on 24 7 so there's a lot more time mm-hmm. it's very hard to get when you have a 20 minute show when I say 20 minute shows it's, it's a half-hour show, six six thirty to seven o'clock. The CBS Evening News, but it's only really eighteen twenty minutes, right? right? Mm-hmm. So, and it's a hard news uh, show. It's ha- and it's hard to get climate in there, especially because climate needs to breathe a little bit. It, you, if you're going to tell a good story, it should be two minutes. Well, that's not easy. So it has to be. It has to. It has to reach a high bar to get on the evening news. It's a little bit easier to get on CBS this morning. We have two hours, and and oftentimes climate stories will end up there. You're looking at. Uh, I have some numbers. Looks like. <laughs> it, it, okay, you brought a cheat sheet. Go I brought a cheat sheet. Tell us. Tell us. I'm an executive producer. <laughs> so, um, what we found, for example, our overall demographics from from our fans and followers and our super engaged uh, audiences: 69 percent are women, 31 percent are men, 57 um, percent are 55 to 65. So that's our sweet spot. Older audience. Older audiences. Um, interestingly, 18 percent are 45 to 54, and then 25 percent are 44 and younger. Why is that important? Why is it engaging? Because in 2017, they n- it was all I- everything that we did was <laughs> 55 to 65. Yeah. So the fact that we now have a 25 percent um, number of people who are 44 and younger. Um, that's you're talking about promise and peril. You're talking yeah, about I'm talking about peril and promise. Climate mm-hmm. coverage. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, this is absolutely. Specific. Okay. This is absolutely specific okay. to yeah. climate change. Well, this suggests what to you about the appetite for this kind of story? It's younger people. Mm-hmm. Like we, we focus a lot on younger audiences. We engage with our student reporting labs. We engage with younger people. We follow the the, the walkouts and the student strikes. You know, we aggressively try to provide coverage and give them access to our online, um, you know, distribution cycles, and it, it has helped. So, so Jen, we, in our audience here, we have people from NGOs and from media and from academia. Sh- should they just be targeting younger audience? Absolutely well, uh, not. No, Absolutely. no, I don't <laughs> think so. I mean, I think the younger people, uh, I think it's wonderful that we do have younger viewers, and it is fantastic and that's you know what we all want right advertiser wise mm-hmm. that's that's what we want but you know the, the earth day was started by what what generation you know i, I get uh, yeah uh, it's a young it's a young demographic yes very young <laughs> i get a lot of mail from uh from baby boomers mm-hmm. specifically <laughs> about uh, this is what i've always wanted you to talk about mm-hmm. thank you for writing about this yeah. i get i've got and i got a, a letter like an actual handwritten letter it was so sweet from a 94 year old from Mississippi who said I don't see the birds as much as I used to see and I think that has something to do with climate thank you for writing about this mm-hmm. topic it's it's not just it's not just the younger generation Megan Parker is here she's uh, executive director of the Society of Environmental, Environmental Journalists <laughs> and 
they're storytellers, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, as I listen to you, I think about the storytelling that mm -hmm. environmental journalists and other journalists, because it's not just environmental journalists are doing. Mm -hmm. And I connect it to a, a, a gathering that we at Planet Forward had, a salon, not unlike this, a few years ago. And in our group was a farmer, a fourth generation <laughs> farmer sure. from Maryland. Mm -hmm. And he started talking about the perils mm -hmm. of the farm mm -hmm. and how hard it is. And that what they had just had to do was spend a lot of money mm -hmm. to reberm and put new drainage mm -hmm. ditches and drainage systems in the farm because the rains have changed. Mm -hmm. That when he was a kid, <laughs> he was a little older, when he was a kid, the spring rains were softer, gentler, more mm -hmm. soaking rains, and now there seem to be more torrential rains. That mm -hmm. washes off soil, that washes off right. topsoil and, and fertilizer and all the rest. That was a very effective story he told to the mm -hmm. group, and people understood that. Mm -hmm. Is the storytelling that you are now doing, and let's talk about how we tell stories here, mm -hmm. more and more built around characters like that? How do you deal with the science? Because you've got, you'd started er earlier talking about the science reports that mm -hmm. you're looking at. Mm -hmm. How do you craft the narrative mm -hmm. so that it's interesting to your audiences? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, like you were talking about, you know, with, with mortgages, if you talk to a relatable human, a farmer who doesn't have a romantic notion of what a farmer is, right? Even though, can you have you ever been on a farm? How hard that work is, yeah. you know, to hear people who doubt um, about have doubts about health care, you know, and and that whole debate. So I can go to Nebraska and have very interesting conversations about very conservative politics. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the climate crisis, they are on board because they see it every day. So are you doing that? Are you going into conservative country sure, deliberately? Sure. Yeah. And seeking characters there deliberately? A absolutely. And do you talk to them about climate change per se? Absolutely. Absolutely. And and they may not use that term. They may use a totally different term. Do you use term. that term? Uh, sure. Sure. I use all sorts of terms. <laughs> <laughs> do you use that term in your storytelling? Yeah. We use uh, climate change. We'll use climate crisis. We'll use global warming. It just depends on whoever is using the language. Okay. So you do sea lots of different rise. kinds of stories, though. Would you say that you're now more focused on character, more focused on mm. this kind of thing? Is that how you keep this fresh and your audience responds to it? I think that's an easier way in than talking about, you know, really complicated scientific stories. But I think that's true for any kind of complicated subject. So how do you get the complicated science in this? <laughs> I don't think there needs to be much. Really? Um, in, in the storytelling, no. I think actually it's a line or two. Maybe. And you don't even necessarily need a scientist to say it. You just offended every scientist in the room. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how many scientists there are, but I mean, you know, there are segments where I'll come on and, and like, do what you saw me do. But often I, there's not a need, and I don't actually think it would be good for me to be in these stories. These are stories about people. Mm -hmm. And you don't need more than a line or two to say, you know, in this part of the United States, it's drier, it's drying out faster than it has in other parts of the world or whatever. You know, and it's warming up faster than it is across, you know, the United States. Um, so you don't need a lot of science. Actually, um, I think they're, they can be somewhat separate, but you can still include just one line of science. What do you consider the most effective, powerful story you've told in, since you've been in this role? The most effective and powerful story? I, well, okay, so we did a, um, a documentary, which was great, CBSN. Um, it was called Climate crisis, I think, in the heartland. Mm -hmm. And it was right after the floods, after the bomb cyclone last year during the spring and you know, during the spring when that storm hit. And we followed a farmer who had a two or three million dollar piece of property right along the Missouri River that he most likely was going to lose mm -hmm. because the Army Corps of Engineers was not going to rebuild his protection because of some loophole. And they were looking for a loophole. He thinks they were looking for a loophole because I don't want to have to rebuild all of the protections. They would rather the river reclaim some of their land, which arguably might be a good idea, but still this poor guy could be, and he has a family to support. Um, you feel really bad for him. At the same time, he won't say the words climate change. And no matter how many times you ask him, he won't give you a straight answer. He, he'll, he'll, you know, or, or he, he, he throws out a bunch of stuff. Well, it was cold last year and, you know, and, and this and that. But finally, when I pushed him hard enough, he said, you know, you guys say climate change, climate change, climate change. It's like you have an agenda. So he got to the point, which is what a lot of people feel in the middle of the country. He was saying what a lot of people feel, which is that this is being used as an agenda tool to force our way of living, our way in the urban areas, on them. And so... And they say scientists is having an agenda too, right? The science has an agenda. Everybody 
they feel like you know that they're, it's being force fed down their throats. And, and it's really not about climate change, it's about forcing kind of a more liberal progressive way of being. Well, farmers generally aren't very progressive. Some of them are, but they aren't always. And so for them, that's maybe a little too much too fast. Um, and they may, that may not be the right way to get through to them. The second part of the story was another farmer who is, who is in Kansas, who is, is a friend with this, friends with this guy, and he's going around to all the farms showing them about regenerative farming. Mm -hmm. And farmers, they may not say the words climate change, a lot of them won't, yeah. but they understand it's happening, even if they won't tell you, and they want to be part of the solution, and that's the key. They would rather you skip the talk about climate change, don't talk about it, but hey, I would love to absorb carbon on my farm. I'd love to not be the devil in this. I'd love to be the hero in this. And, and that's what we learned in this. And it was, please, take a look at this CBSN. It's called CBSN, CBSN Originals. It is, and I don't, not just because I work for CBS, uh, CBS, I thought it was the best climate documentary I've ever seen in my life. I haven't seen every one. Well. Um, I'm sure it's probably not. <laughs> <laughs> not, I haven't seen, but I haven't seen hers, and I'm sure if I, if I had seen it. I'll send you the link. Okay. Anyway, so I think you get the point. Um, I, I don't, I personally do not like to shove it down people's throats because that makes them close off, and you'll never get through to them so again. So there's very, there's a really interesting discussion, mm -hmm. debate, controversy really in the climate communication field about apocalyptic framing, right. about the peril that mm -hmm. you're talking about, whether that's needed. I'm sure many of you have read David Wallace Wells, his, you know, which, which, the New York, famous New York piece, which was like, you know, we're, we're toast, mm -hmm. okay, we're done. Uh, and he was criticized for taking sort of worst case scenarios and playing those out. Others would say, take the worst case scenarios, <laughs> show how bad it can be to show what's really at stake mm -hmm. here. Where are you on that, Eugenia, in terms of thinking about, because you mentioned earlier, and it's fascinating to me, it's the peril that sells more than the promise, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's like, like I say to people, if your kid comes home with a report card and he's got four A's and one D, what do you ask for, ask about first? Absolutely. What happened here? And so, and with these extreme weathers, whether it's Australia burning or California burning or drought or any of those things, that, whether you call it weather porn or not, mm -hmm. that's a that's, that's powerful that's picture, powerful. right? Mm -hmm. I side with science. I mean, you know, you asked earlier, we, as part of my reporting, I am not a scientist, so I have to adhere to them, right? I have to adhere to the scientists and what they are saying. Um, my perspective from uncovering climate change is that it's real. It's a science-based fact. We treat it as such. Now, in our coverage, we just did a, uh, an hour-long special for um, News Hour weekend um, where we went down the Mississippi. We did Peril and Promise down mm -hmm. the Mississippi, um, also using uh, some people from Climate Nexus um, as part of our, our researchers and, and, and reporters. And um, we got to the bottom of Mississippi, and guess what? The riverboat captains didn't, they said sea level rising, mm -hmm. right? They didn't want to acknowledge it. They didn't want to use those words. But um, when, when we asked questions, the reporters asked questions in a really smart, um, definitive way, they said, yeah, it is. It's not popular to say it in these parts, but it is. I will always side with science. Mm -hmm. I will always side with science. Can, can I say, um, we did a story, I think last year, about what do you call it, or why is it called climate change now? Why, or why, why did we go from global warming? We, we know that story. Um, <coughs> but a lot of the climate scholars I spoke with said, I don't care what you call it. Right. I just care that you do Talk something about it, about it <laughs> that you worry about it and you make it better. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard a scholar at Harvard say that to me, I thought, okay, well, Maybe language doesn't matter, and we shouldn't be so hung up on the vocabulary, even though we are in the business of words, which is really important. Um, but if we can get at the bigger story, then, then maybe that's okay. I, I want to go to um, a question that I've got from the audience in a minute, but if, before I do, I want to kind of summarize a little bit and, and actually um, spin it this way. For people in the audience who are dealing with um, news organizations, media companies, journalists, for people in the audience, who are working at corporations or NGOs where they're trying to communicate this. As you think about expanding the audience, targeting the, the, the message, building around character, what advice, mm -hmm. what, what would you take from this conversation we've had now in two or three points that you would commend to people who are trying to communicate from whatever perspective they're part of the climate change story? Meet people where they are. Know your audience. 
right? Um, if you're speaking to people who are fairly progressive, you can say emergency crisis, you can say whatever you want. If you're speaking to people that are conservative, then you have to shape this in conservative terms. What I actually wrote this- Shape it in conservative terms. Use, use the- Yeah, well, let me tell you how, um, which I think is a great way to do it. I wrote this long paper on it, so I'm convinced. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nicely done. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah well, I mean, think about what we have to do to combat climate change. We need to change everything. Mm -hmm. We need to create vast amounts of industries. And we in inevitably have to create millions of new jobs. We, there's no way around it. So how do you speak to someone who's conservative or a libertarian? You say, you talk about the, amount, the tremendous amount of jobs that inevitably have to come. There is just no way around it. And, and high paying jobs, by the way. So I think, you know, I think you have to speak to, and it's true. And you, I'm not, you, I'm not and lying. And I'm you're just doing that in your reporting. I, well, not necessarily. Yes, so, yes. When I'm on TV, and I'm, I did actually a segment on C CBS this morning, and I actually said exactly what I just said, which is, think about, a, think about how this could be, a shot in the arm for America, and, and a brand new day for brand new industries, uh, and for and 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 to revive places in the United States that have been abandoned because of manufacturing left. This is a great chance to do that. So we got to take our foot off Jen, the brake. Jen, what is your advice to people who are storytellers of whatever sort in this in our audience? I mean, if if you can simplify and avoid jargon as much as possible. There was a great study this week about how people die because of jargon. And when doctors use jargon, people don't hear what they're people saying. Die because people of jargon. die because of jargon. So I would say the same thing would be this case for climate change. If you use jargon the whole time, then people aren't going to be able to understand it. Make it as simple as possible, just like with any other kind of complicated issue. Um, but it doesn't have to be complicated too, right? I mean, we did, I did a study about how people in the future may not be able to flush their toilets in Miami because sept tanks aren't going to work anymore. I mean, everyone flushes, a, now, uh, everyone <laughs> flushes a toilet, right? I think I, I think I saw that or read that because <laughs> Because I, that sticks in my mind, because I, I lived in Miami for years, and that does stick in my mind. And I think you might have said something to the extent of, that might actually get people mm -hmm. before the actual water invades their homes. Mm -hmm. And what about the apocalyptic frame? Should people avoid that? Should we not do that? Or do we need to, frankly, scare people? I mean, Bill McKibben, right? Mm. David Wallace Wells, yeah. they're out there. They're effective. Their names are known. Sure. That's what gets you ratings. Mm -hmm. Is that what? But I'm. I but when I'm on the fact check team for the debate, am I correcting the candidates who are saying we're going to lose life in 12 years? Yes, I'm fixing that. But I, I think we have to have those honest conversations about what could happen. Um, do we need to f dwell on it? Probably not. That's not the most effective way because what in talking to professors who are teaching this, they say that the f one professor I talked to in Oregon said the first week she does a whole lesson on grief and dealing with the grief of what you're going to be missing in the future. And so she said, if you're only going to focus on the horribleness, you're not going to be able to move. And you're going to have students who are up late at night, she said, crying and calling her at three in the morning. I have mm -hmm. students, so this gets to me introducing you for your advice, but I, I talk to students all the time in the classes that I teach. Some of them are here. I had a conversation with a class just um, recently, where I will ask, especially the young women, whether they've thought about mm -hmm. not having kids because of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there will be several hands in this last class, a quarter of the young women in the class said, I've decided not to have a kid, raise their hand, and said, I'm not going to have a kid because of this. Sure. So the downside to the doomsday scenario is it can make people feel desperate, disempowered, I can't do anything, we're going off the cliff. How do you, how should we as storytellers deal with that? We have to deal with it with kindness and, and I think a great deal of compassion. Um, on a much smaller scale, I work with two very young women who are brilliant and talented and we have these actual conversations. And I say to them, you know, is this truly how you feel? And they say, one says, oh no, I'm having five kids. 
<laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> That's optimistic. Um, also expensive. That's another right. conversation. I know, I, I, uh, <laughs> and she's working at PBS. <laughs> 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 she's got faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I think she's helping to marry well. Okay. Um, but, um, but, I, but I think that it's, it, it is extraordinarily real. But I do think, though, that we have to deal with, with telling these stories, um, you know, to your point, where people are. And like genuinely knowing your audience and genuinely knowing the people who you're trying to reach and, and saying what comes into play. One of our bigger um, stories that we got a hit about, you know, was uh, on the production of the cacao mm -hmm. bean mm -hmm. and that chocolate would be affected. Mm -hmm. And everybody was like, wait, let's fix this now. <laughs> you know, and and yeah. we just did a piece recently on the wine area mm -hmm. of, of Italy <laughs> and, and, and a lot of women responded to that. <laughs> one, you know. Well, it's really interesting to see what public opinion is doing because mm -hmm. I think it drives that. You know, the Yale program on climate change did this thing where they found six and 10 Americans now alarmed or concerned about global warming. Absolutely. In yeah. five years from 2013 to 2018 when they did this, the proportion of those saying they were alarmed doubled. Yes. Mm. The Panetta Institute wow. recently uh, uh, tracked college students, wow. mm. and they f and they and they they <laughs> polled them by party, mm -hmm. among other things, Ooh. and they found that 58 percent of the students identifying as Republican and conservative felt that climate change was an, a big issue and that government needed to be doing taking active mm -hmm. steps, mm. which is of course substantially different than older Republicans in the in the national polling we've seen. So that's an interesting thing. I, I want to go to a question now that we've got from the audience. We've gotten some, which we'll see on video in just a moment, and uh, a couple uh, that have been sent to us in the old-fashioned way by handwriting, and then we'll put a microphone up here uh, and, and hear some more. But this is a very interesting one, um, and this can be to all of you because you're all in this space. How do you deal with TV managers who want you to tell the other side of the story on climate change? Anybody want to go first on that? I mean, it, this is a tough one, right? Mm -hmm. um, you you tiptoe around it. You're not going to fool your manager. Um, if you really do want to tell the other side of the story, and you go and tell the other side of the story, it's the sun that's causing climate change. You can disprove it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, your boss would be upset with you, but the truth is, is you could do a you know climate myths. A write up for your website or a story online. I wouldn't put it on TV because you might get in trouble from your boss. But mm -hmm. so I would use the other, I would do a lot of my climate change stuff if I had bosses that really didn't like it. I would do it on slightly less visible mm -hmm. parts of, of, of you know, uh, platforms. That's that's the my answer to the What's question. What's the conversation mm -hmm. at CNN? How do you tell the other side of the story, or do you not even think there is an other side of the story? No, I mean ninety-eight percent of climate scientists say this is real. So, so there's is there an other side to the story? No. Yeah. No. I, I, what's the other, I mean, we, we get religious people, right, saying mm -hmm. that, and, and oh, right. I'm not at all disparaging against that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, who who say you know, God will take care of it. And I said, mm. have you read the Old Testament? <laughs> <laughs> and they say, <laughs> yeah, uh, Cliff Notes. <laughs> New Testament. No. You know, and I mean, but that's funny, but then, there are, but then there's an equal amount of yeah. people who are very religious who actually are waiting for Armageddon and are ready yes. to bring it on and yes. who are accepting that well, it is what it is. Right. You know, God said this was going to happen, and it's happening. Mm -hmm. So that is very hard to work with. Do you mm -hmm. take that on as a reporter? Uh, do I take it on as a reporter? Um, no, do I you? don't. But I often will say, cre I will often talk about creation care. I will say, if you believe that God created this, would you put your feet up on God's table? Well, no. we're putting our feet up on God's earth right now. This is his creation. Mm -hmm. Why are we, dis if we're put here to be the caregivers or the man if, if you if you owned a store and you asked your manager to you you have go ahead you have you have you can dominate this place it's totally your place you expect that that manager is going to still take care of it and not destroy it so you, you might have given what's the word i'm looking for yeah but the other word uh the other word <laughs> that god gave us um dominion, dominion over mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we can trash the place you know and so the point is is you know, y you can, I do sometimes talk about it in terms of religion. So, so One of the big reasons I got into it in the first place, I'm not very religious, to, but it's an ethical issue for me. Sure. Let me come back to the question because I think That's it's fair. really interesting. Mm -hmm. And if we can answer it, maybe for those who are here and for those who are watching, there's some useful information here. 
let's say you are a, a journalist and you're at a station, maybe it's a local station, or you're at a paper or whatever else, and you actually have a manager, you have a boss who says, look, I hear it all the time, the president says he doesn't believe th in this, uh, I want you to tell the other side of the story. What should that journalist say? You have to get really creative. <laughs> Honestly, no, no, and I mean this very, very seriously. I mean, there are ways to tell it. Maybe you tell it through children. Maybe you let the children tell tell the story, and you can sort of see where the conversation ends, right? Or maybe you do bring on their most storied or or, or credentialed do you say, climate denier. Do you say I'm not going to tell the other story side of the story? Because I would I probably don't believe there is one. I is would probably do it one time with the hopes of shutting them up or shutting them down. <laughs> honestly, mm -hmm. and because you, it's sort of like saying there's no wind, right? Like you can not believe that there's wind, but something is air is going to move, mm -hmm. you know. And so at some point, it. The conversation ends. There are but some you legitimate gripes on the other side of this issue. I mean, and I think those stories can be told, like the idea that the world's going to end in 2030. Mm -hmm. That's not real. No scientist has said that, but it's been slightly blown out of proportion by the media. And so you can set that record straight. That's telling the mm -hmm. other side of the story. Hey, the world's not going to end in 2030. There's still good science in there. There's truth in there. You are delving into the other side of this, which is that the other side believes that a lot of progressive people or anybody who believes in climate change thinks the world is going to end in 2030. So there are some end, you know, the worst case scenario situations. How, how true is it that Antarctica is about to collapse into the sea? Well, actually, not so true. The scientists say that it, in a few decades, maybe we could see, uh, you know, one of the ice sheets become dis unstable. And, and so you you can tell and it, but tell it correcting certain myths. Well, about and the it. other side of the story isn't only that climate change isn't happening. It isn't only that human beings aren't causing it. It mm -hmm. could also be that this is a natural, you know, we see this periodically, or lefties all want to spend too much money on this, or we can have clean coal. I mean, there are a variety of different stories that can represent the other side. But right? I think it's a false equivalency to say the other side. You know, the other side is not science. I, I mean, you know, the other side is that clip that you showed in the intro, mm -hmm. where we have all mm -hmm. of those news articles, and in the end, you have you know the president saying, "Yeah, I don't believe it." So, mm -hmm. all right, I, w the, but he's we also haven't said he believes it periodically. He says he, he does periodically it. say he mm -hmm. believes it. Sometimes he says China gave it to us, mm -hmm. you know, That's right? True. That yeah. made it up. Remember yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. No, we've tracked all the things that he said. It's really interesting how it changes. God. So you could oh. you know point. That out too. I'm, I'm, I'm listening <laughs> very closely. We haven't made this a political conversation, but you can't have a discussion about this without, you know, having some reflection on how do you tell this story at a time of um, when there is a, a the, you know, the ruling party of the country which rejects much of the science and certainly rejects the regulatory framework that had been put together by the previous administration and by most governments around the world. To, to do this. So do you take that on? Do we take that on in, in, in your storytelling or do you leave that to the side? You have to acknowledge when the President of the United States who's, who's implementing this policy and proposing this policy is, is just coming out and saying, you know, this doesn't exist. Yes, the question is how do you do it? How do you? You, you roll this clip mm -hmm. and then you say the part that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or point out, like when uh, the big report came out and he buried it in um, uh, on, on Friday. Black Friday. Oh, Friday. Right. remember? Right. right, yeah. So we just point, we point those things out. Mm -hmm. uh, when he rolls back uh, coal legislation or is trying to, then we point out the, the footnote in the memo that Par says 1,400 extra people will die each year. So paradoxically, I think one reason we're here and one reason that you're saying what you're saying is precisely because of what the president and others are doing. It is it in fact this sort of head-on collision in politics that has driven a lot of the focus on climate change. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, wouldn't you agree so with that? This is what I would say. I would say that I might not be sitting here today if Obama was still president because I wouldn't have been necessary. I would have thought I wasn't necessary because I, I, I saw at the time what was going on, um, not only politically but on TV, that's why I jumped into the game. But it's interesting because in a way, because Trump has pushed so hard against climate action, a lot of regular everyday citizens have risen up for climate action. I think if Obama had still been in office, um, or someone like Obama was still in office, we'd be like, ah, you know what, they got that taken care of. Truth is they didn't have it taken care of and we still don't have it taken care of. 
So this actually, in a way, was kind of a wake-up call, and I think it's possible that we'd be sitting here with a lot less people worried about climate change right now if there was someone in office who took it seriously. So it's that, I think, colliding with the extreme events and the headlines that get written anyway. Here are just a few headlines I, I pulled just. The Arctic Ocean has lost 95% of its oldest ice. Mm -hmm. One million species face extin extinction. A surprising new picture of ocean circulation. A meteorologist's warning, we're running out of time to save ourselves. So we've got this, again, confluence of, of fascinating politics mm -hmm. with this kind of reality that appears to be much more prevalent Mm -hmm. in, in the news stream, in people's lives, in their own experience. And that, I think, has set you all up to be doing a lot of what you're doing. It certainly has set our students up. Speaking of students, we have a question from a student. How do we do science and incorporate this? So let's go to the video and <laughs> meet him. Hi, my name is Max Seno, and I'm a sophomore at Franklin and Marshall College. And my question is, how can the National Academy of Sciences better be used to verify science and those who speak on behalf of it when a lot of the controversy um, in science communication stems from who has the authority to speak on behalf of science. How can we use that academy better? <laughs> Thanks, Max. You're a scientist. <laughs> well, first of all, I will say that the National Academy of Sciences is very involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, they have issued many statements on this, and they often issue statements on it. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, s skepticism in, in certain ranks uh, about, about anybody speaking of climate change. It doesn't matter who it is. Uh, God could come down and talk about climate change and, <laughs> and it wouldn't be acceptable necessarily. So I don't know that we can really use the National Academy of Sciences. We just need a critical mass and we just need to slowly and surely change people's minds. And I think it's actually happening. We're seeing it happen in public opinion. Unfortunately, we have to be somewhat patient. And it also unfortunately means that we're gonna be a little bit late to fixing the game and we're gonna suffer some damage because of it. Um, but that's human nature, right? Human nature is not to really deal with stuff until it's to the point where we really have to deal with stuff. So we have to deal with other questions <laughs> from the floor and I get to invite anybody to the microphone now. And what I'd like to ask uh, for those of you who, who would like to participate in this conversation, um, target your question at the group or an individual, um, short, sweet, succinct, so that we can get more in. Uh, if one person steps to the mic and other people want to ask, please go to the back of the room and Dan Reed, our executive, our executive in charge here, our executive producer, will steer you toward the mic one at a time. So who wants to go first? Anybody brave? <laughs> Sir. <laughs> and I'd ask you to just introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, and then fire away. And others who have questions, please go to the back of the room. Uh, Michael Svoboda with George Washington University and a contributor to Yale Climate Connections. Yeah. Um, wondered if uh, the Covering Climate Now initiative was a factor in any of your activities, any of your programs this year. We love Covering Climate Now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we are we are members as well. Can you just explain what that is? A covering it's it's, it's, a, it's a journalist a journalistic uh, consortium of news organizations and climate organizations who are committed to covering uh, climate change, and we contribute stories to them. Um, I would almost con liken it to a uh, an Associated Press of of news things because you have the access to the stories that uh, each of the, the members are using. It's fantastic. Um, we were doing it first. Um, we joined on, you know, uh, quickly because we love them, and we also love the folks at Yale, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but we no, we do. We do. We use the research as well. And you love the folks at GW. Too. I love. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make sure. Border on obsession. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, so yeah, absolutely. It's an amazing organization, and and I and I want it to you know really grow and and gain you know continue its momentum. You've quantified some of this, haven't you? Uh, me personally, yeah, it's great. I'll tell you why it's great because uh, you know it, it it was started by uh, Columbia Journalism Review, which is kind of a standard bearer in the industry, and I think that for executives, especially in New York, they hold Columbia Journalism Review in high esteem. And one of the, 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 the obstacles that we've faced is, especially over the past year or two, is can, should we cover climate change? Is that such a tainted and biased um, story that we, you know, I, I felt that way. And I, I think what happened was when I signed up with, when I, could, when I brought it to the attention of CBS News and we got signed up, when our president signed up, 
all the other journalists who were kind of waiting in the background, who wanted to do climate change but didn't want to say they wanted to do climate change or weren't able to push it through the moment that our president signed up with covering climate now, who might have done it because, you know, of the, um, because of the credibility that Columbia Journalism View has, all of a sudden people came out of the woodworks and wanted to do climate change and every reporter was fighting over stories. And so it um, gave us cover. Maybe covering cover. climate now. Reporters needed cover. Well, I'm not saying that they did, but I'm telling you, having kind of worked to bring it to CBS, why I brought it to CBS, because I think that a lot of journalists were tiptoeing. What about CNN? Uh, I think. I, I, I'm not part of, I don't know. Do you, do journalists tiptoe on covering this story? No, not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. No, we have quite a few people fighting to cover these stories. Uh, it's it's a priority of our our news president. It's a priority of our digital news president. So it gets it gets attention. It gets on the front of our digital page. It even if it's a story that is a, about a very small study that no one cares about and three people read it, it's still getting the attention. Another question from the floor as someone moves to a microphone. How do you deal with colleagues in a more influential position than you who don't believe in climate change? Have you had that experience? I haven't. Uh, not where I am right now, at least. Do yeah. you have advice? I mean, we have a memo in our company that says this is real. And, you know, so at least at my, at my network, we're very lucky we don't have those kind of conversations. I have a friend at Fox. <laughs> <laughs> is that a comma or a period? <laughs> comma. <laughs> and we've actually had this conversation. Really? Yeah, nobody in, I live in reality, so nobody in, at, you know, at, at, at our program, at Project, you know, ha we, ha we don't have that issue, but um, it's, it's the decision to not cover it. I don't think it's so much mm -hmm. as they don't believe in it, but they don't believe in the, they have not made the decision to cover it. And does that, it. does that friend of yours fight that or try to? She tries. And she tries. How? What does she say? What is, that's a great, this would be a great example. Mm -hmm. She says, this is crazy, and, <laughs> and they ignore her. Mm -hmm. And uh, they say that our viewers see this as a political problem, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They do. and and it's a uh, it's 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 rhetoric and jargon, mm -hmm. and we're not going to engage in that. We will cover the weather, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we will cover um, you know rising sea levels. We will certainly cover the storms, and we will cover you know the the news of it. Mm -hmm. But we are not going to, and I don't think this is a written rule. But they have told her, you know, in her capacity as a show producer, hmm. that we're not going to to do this. And I got so walking in with the science, showing <laughs> the hockey stick, showing temperatures, mm -hmm. that's not going to move somebody like that? I just, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Data is never going to move those people. It's just never going to happen. It's all about ideology. The reason why they, they will push back against climate change has nothing to do with the science. It's all about their predisposed ideology. So you need to meet them where they are. It's the same answer again, yeah. which is if they are religious, maybe you can talk about religious stuff. If it's, if it's, if it's that they're conservative, maybe you need to talk about how it's gonna, it can make for a better economy, how it's not a crisis, but it's a climate opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to be a better nation. It's, it's like, like with same-sex marriage. You know, there were lots of people who didn't believe in equality for marriage. And so there was a movement to get people to come out Right. It was simple. It was just so then when friends in conservative circles saw people that they liked were in this world and they, they couldn't they couldn't hate you. Right. Because they knew you. Then they started to change their minds. Mm -hmm. That's why the human stories are so important. Well, And you might have even been someone's son or daughter. And yeah. what gets interesting in the climate discussion is how young yes. people yeah. are changing yes. their sure. attitudes sure. and behaviors. Sure. Next question. Houston Miller, I'm a climate scientist at GW. <laughs> That's not what my question is going to be about. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I'm, I'm reading through uh, David Walswell's book after reading the article and attending Frank's uh, session on this, uh, I guess it was just last year, and I was struck by something, that, and I'm paraphrasing in the first, uh, the first chapter there talking about, uh, and I'll, I'll put some my own words in here, climate change are the middle and last names, but the first word is global. And uh, mm. in, his, in that first chapter, he talks about how 
uh, at a time when this really is something that calls for international cooperation, nationalism is really uh, 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 destroying this. And as someone who spent a lot of the last couple of years nonstop watching CNN and MSNBC, and hour after hour we get politics, 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 mm -hmm. which I feel is a little bit pushing us a little bit more toward those nationalistic things, is what are the responsibilities of the networks to broadening the perspective and bringing back uh, international cooperation? Great question. Go ahead, CNN. Uh, <laughs> I cannot speak from our network or the uh, decisions that they that they make. I, I do think it is an international topic. Certainly, uh, we write a lot about it, and that's where the majority of our our people are are, are reading us, as opposed to always watching us. Um, it's it's an important part of the conversation, and and yes, I I, I think certainly global is it. Um, global in terms of ratings doesn't sell, right? So you have to what be mean, able... global in terms of ratings doesn't sell? American news doesn't cover the world as much as when you're in the rest of the world, yeah, right? right? So you have to trick people into caring about the... Don't quote me on that. Um, you, Too late. You have, to, <laughs> you have to help people understand yeah. why the rest of the world matters. Yeah. So it's probably not the best answer to your question, but I, I think that, that people are seeing it. Um, there was a study this just this week about how uh, pollution uh, impacts across state lines, right? It's, it's not just because it's in your backyard, it's, it's several backyards over. And how important it is that at the national level we care about this, not just at the state level. You know, you could have the cleanest air in the world if you take care of it, but if New York is not taking care of it, then, then we're in trouble. So, so we try to show those connections um, and, and try to remind people about why those things are important. Okay, you want to go ahead. I was going to say, we look at best practices. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's a, an African in, in, mm -hmm. in uh, Tanzania, I think. There's a, you know, a global farming initiative to um, increase sustainability, and we, we showcase those, mm -hmm. right? As, you know, here's what our farmers could start nice. doing. They're taking the lead. You know, uh, the, the, the wind, windmills, wind, wind factories in Norway, we, 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 talk, we tell those stories and just say, you know, again, globally, here's what, what they're doing. Why can't we? But this is mm -hmm. brutal stuff. I, I, I get to tell a story. I was, when I was doing a, a, a doc, mm -hmm. the, my documentary for CNN, mm -hmm. um, I was going to go down to Brazil because I want to do this cool story that 40% of Brazil's transportation fuel comes from sugarcane ethanol. Like, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. That's a renewable wow. fuel. It's amazing. Right, right. And incredible. so I was ready to go, and somebody called and said, why are you going to Brazil? Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you mean, why am I going to Brazil? 40% of the fuel is grown from the ground. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, Americans don't give up bleep about Brazil. That's a quote. <laughs> from a producer. Mm -hmm. And I had to go head to head and said, hang on a second. And he finally said, okay, you can go, but you have to promise you'll make it real mm -hmm. and relevant to an American audience. Yeah. So here's what I did. Mm -hmm. I rented a little Chevrolet in Brazil. <laughs> I drove through the sugar cane field. The cameraman was next to me in the seat. It was the coolest stand up I ever did. I was <laughs> driving. And I said to the camera, Why I'm driving a Chevrolet. Why do I have to come to Brazil to fill it up with renewable fuel. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was that okay? That's, That's good. Okay. Awesome. That's good. But, but it's like, why can't we just mm -hmm. make something intrinsically interesting that's interesting? Mm -hmm. Well, we yeah. can't. The fact of the matter is we do have to make it relevant. Mm -hmm. We have to be mm -hmm. thoughtful of our audience. But, Next question. But like you keep saying, we have to meet the audience where they are, so we have to help them understand why the rest of the world right. So matters. rent a Chevrolet and go to Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> go. How much was that gas, though? How, How much, much was it? It was yeah. a little bit more. Uh -huh. It's a little bit more, and it smells like molasses when you go to the... <laughs> it's it's kind of cool. But, but, and, but they, you know, I mean, it's a great, it's a really interesting story because you don't get quite the same mileage out of it. Actually, it was less, the cost was less per gallon or liter, but you get a little less mileage. Mm -hmm. But, but it's, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's equivalent, mm -hmm. okay? But, you know, wh why would somebody pay $85,000 for a Tesla, okay? I mean, you got mm -hmm. lots, of, lots of questions here, and people make choices mm -hmm. all the time. All the time? Mm -hmm. Next question. Yes, and that kind of leads into my point. My name is Michael Kohler. I'm a sophomore here at the School of Media and Public Affairs. I took uh, Director Cessna's class on this topic last semester. Um, and so what I, I really liked what you guys were saying about, you know, bringing in middle America and, you know, covering stories there and meeting, you know, people where they are in that sense. And I was recently in Davenport, Iowa, where the river flooded the town, and they don't necessarily believe in climate change, but they know for sure that downtown flooded last year because of the Missi Mississippi Rising. However, that being said, you know, there's still big things to tackle with climate change. And I think, you know, some storytellers might be reluctant when you tell them, hey, we need to talk about this problem, but hey, 
don't name the problem. Mm -hmm. So where, you know, if we're getting in the weeds here, where in language do we talk about climate change without saying the very polarized words of climate change? So instead of saying the actual words, I will often on air, I'll say in a warming world or as the world mm -hmm. warms in a kind of passive way. But the real story in places like that is the fact that, you know, wind turbines, uh, are, and industries are coming alive. Places that were dead for decades are, you know, kids don't have to leave and go somewhere else. They can stay home in their towns. The real stories in these places are, believe it or not, the solutions for climate change are coming out of middle America. So don't talk about climate change. Don't force it on them. Talk about how these great stories and these great opportunities are coming out of middle America. Because that is really the story in middle America oftentimes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm not saying you don't mention it, but but be subtle. I, I never, I rarely ever use the term cl climate crisis. You use, do you use climate crisis? Every day. You use climate crisis? Uh, I, I, well, I, I climate change. Crisis, uh, no, not so much, but change. Change, and you're doing climate crisis. We do, that is one of the words, one of the phrases, yes. But I use it in context, right? In context, I'll yeah. If it's a story about fires in, right. in Australia, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll use the word climate crisis mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. But it has to really feel like a crisis. Mm -hmm. It can't be yeah. some crisis that's going to hit in mm -hmm. 20 years if I'm, I'm not going to use that word. I because I think that you'll alienate people. I want to bring people in. Mm -hmm. in. In Davenport, though, I mean, if you have an opportunity to show the data and say, do you remember when you were a kid, did you see the mm -hmm. floods like this? You know, and just remind, people have very short memories about their experience, but if you can remind them about, you know, as they were a kid, oh gosh, I don't remember it flooding so much. Mm -hmm. and, and just kind of bring it into relative terms that way. They can connect that's the dots. You don't need to say the words yeah. climate change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, they see it. They see it, they just don't sure. want to admit it. Sure. So just keep showing them, you know, little by little, and, and, uh, and you know, it'll come around. Mm -hmm. Next question. Hi, my name is Quill Robinson. Uh, I work for the American Conservation Coalition. We're the largest right of center environmental group in the country. So I'm your token Republican here, <laughs> um, <laughs> talking about diversity. Um, so I want to double down on weather porn. I, I think that this is a really important point. And as we tell, as I, I think that the awareness of climate change has spread massively, and I see that among fellow Republicans, young Republicans in particular, mm -hmm. but the story of climate Armageddon is taken too far and I see a lot of science and disinformation or anti-science disinformation when I talk to students. For instance, people thinking that we are gonna die in 12 years and that's just not the science. And so I wanna take a hard look at that and, and really hear you guys' opinions on how can we be more discerning about shifting the conversation from climate Armageddon to solutions? Because when I talk to a lot of students, they don't know that American emissions went down 2.1% last year. They don't know the innovation that's happening here. And so we have an opportunity to shift it from alarmism <coughs> to solutions, and I want to know how you guys can do that. I'm going to actually start that um, because the, 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 the frame around the Planet Forward project is innovations. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is what are the innovations that can move the planet forward? That's news by definition. Some of them are, are unbelievably interesting. Uh, they're going to happen anyway, whether you believe in climate change or not. We're going to have electricity storage and change the way we power ourselves. Mm -hmm. Period. Full stop. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's also exciting because people love inventors, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a great space there. But I'm very mindful of what you said, <laughs> that that's not the stuff that rates. The, people want the solutions, but they watch the, the weather porn. So take on his question. I, I will. Uh, number <laughs> one, I, I do have to tell you that people are already dying. And we already have climate refugees. There are parts of southern Louisiana that have been completely evacuated, where entire um, generations of families have been displaced already. Mm -hmm. So that's real. That's all. I'm just going to ask you to acknowledge that that's, that's real. Um, part two of that, though, is that um, there are natural resources available. You can use nature, you know, whether it's replanting of trees, whether it's rebuilding of oyster walls, whether it's, um, you know, using sustainable projects and products along the way. There are some both nature-made and man-made solutions, and we do try to focus on them. We were actually just in Davenport um, as part of the series that we did on the, we followed the Mississippi, the peril and promise along the Mississippi, and, and Davenport was, a, was one of the places where we, where we uh, started. But um, so, so yeah, the stories, there's the stories are there and, you know, you do try to, to show those, but human nature is that you always look at the train crash, right? You just do. It's just human nature. I, I wish I could say that, you know, we don't, that we, you know, keep our eyes focused on the road and continue forward, but we will always look at the crash. That's, that's 
this was what we are. So um, those are the two things that I would just like to say to that point. But but please know that it's there. It's really people are really already dying in America. Jen, you have a comment on the question? I, I mean, I, I think we. I think what's wonderful about the climate conversation is it is all encompassing. So we do write about the young inventor who's working on better energy <coughs> efficiency. We write about carbon capture and how expensive it is, but boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could do this? You know, we, we, we talk about these issues. Um, they may not get as many clicks, but we still do it because it's important to be able to kind of seed these conversations and be able to inspire people, hopefully, to, to make it better. We need to wrap in just a few minutes. I see a couple more questions. Let's see if we can get to those quickly. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Lisa Palmer. I am the National Geographic Visiting Professor of Science Communication here at GW. And um, I come here with a background of 20 years in journalism. So I've been covering the climate uh, change conversation since around 2007, almost exclusively, ranging from deep dives into religion uh, and to public health or you know, even just the science of climate change. Um, you know, I'm now teaching class in science reporting here at GW. I tell the, I, I don't use this word, I'm going to borrow this, so be the troops of the willing. I, I, I'm teaching them how to be the trusted source and how to get science in on every beat. Mm -hmm. You know, they can have a science story in every beat that they cover. How can they get the climate change story in every beat they cover? You know, how can they be those troops of the willing that can actually bring, you know, some of the science as well as the climate story in whatever beat they end up covering, whether it's uh, they're covering something around, whether it is truly in the science beat or public affairs or, like, or international um, you know, politics or whatever they're doing, how can they get that climate story in there? Virginia There's Williams. so much intersectionality, mm -hmm. right? You can't do a health story without eventually talking about climate. You can't do a financial story without, um, I love, by the way, I love talking about the, the financial aspects of solving climate change and, and making money. That's, that is the A plus. People like money. <laughs> People like money. People like money. Turns out. Right. And so. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? So, you, you know, financial stories, you know, the, the intersectionality is so across the board. Race, ethnicity, health care, um, building blocks. It's just, it's just it's mm -hmm. it's a two Google clips, clicks. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're going to hit it. Mm -hmm. It's just there. It's just there. Last question. Hi, Karen Florini from Climate Central. Jen, this is a question for you, and it's related to a couple that have been asked before, one on connecting the dots and one on solutions. Is there a way to integrate mentions of solutions when you're doing broader stories that aren't climate-based, but rather based around the economy, based around national security, based around health? How do you make that work? That's a great question. Um, I, I do think, well, yes, absolutely, if you have time. Right, so if you have a minute 15 package in when I was working in local news, probably not. But when we talk about the economy, most definitely, we will highlight an industry that's doing something innovative with uh, solar energy. Or we can talk about why um, Honda's hybrid didn't do so well, but Toyota's did well. So there are, because it looked distinctive, <laughs> right? So we can, we can talk about things that are um, impactful without necessarily saying this is a climate change story absolutely and I think it's um, it's really key uh, because if we don't weave it into conversations then it, it essentially we have to normalize it right so it's not just this other thing that we're gonna think about when we have time or when we can be in the right place to think about how scary it could be Right, so if we can integrate it into business and uh, talk about healthcare, I talked to somebody about a efficient run hospital. We were talking about something completely different, but she in that conversation said, you know, we actually have a whole sustainability culture here. We have a committee working specifically on this issue. So all I did was write a, a sentence about it in this conversation about how hospitals are trying to save money. But I got calls specifically about that one line. So I, I, I think that is definitely an effective thing to do. Two years ago, a student went out and did a story on DC taxis, mm -hmm. which is not known to have the most modern taxi fleet in the world, <laughs> uh, and compared, got up, found a, a, a fellow who was driving some 1903 Crown Vic. <laughs> you know the old Ford Crown Vics, mm -hmm. terrible gas mileage? Mm -hmm. And then found somebody who was driving a hybrid. 
and just did the story on the gasoline savings mm. between the yeah. Crown Vic Spine. and the hybrid, really not smart. only paid, made the payment on his new car, sure. but put more money in his pocket. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a climate change story. Mm -hmm. It was just a dollars and cents cool hybrid story. Mm -hmm. It's like, whoa, I think I'll go buy a hybrid. <laughs> <That's much. laughs> so you kind of you kind of can make a connection on that <laughs> level. So mm -hmm. I, I want to go back to the question that yeah. you asked. What's your name again? Quill. Quill, OK. Because I think it's important that we acknowledge something that he's bringing up. Now, I don't know if I have the answer for you. Although I will tell you, when I communicate climate change, I try to do it as balanced as I possibly can. I don't go overboard, because I don't want to lose the people that I really need. I already have most progressives. I don't have to worry about them. I have to worry about bringing in the people in the middle, the people who might be willing to listen to me. So all I would say is understand what he said is true, which is that a lot of people on the other side of the political spectrum truly believe that this is, you know, they really believe it's socialism. They really believe, they look at climate change as a proxy for socialism, especially the ones that are on the far right. So you can ignore that fact, but we will need everyone's help to fix this problem, mm -hmm. everybody's. So understand when you say stuff, it can't be flippant. Right. You know, you need to be honest with people. This is a real emergency, mm -hmm. but it is one that we can, you know, that we can take on and, and we have to do it in a way where we're inclusive of other people. And for some people, the words climate crisis, climate emergency are a uh, no-no. They are not, they are gonna shut people down. So that, that is my entry to you. I understand that. It's hard because every time you write a head, every time a headline is written for a newspaper <laughs> or a website, it's written to be the absolute worst part of the story. <laughs> and so if people don't read the story, they're like, ah, oh, you know, it's, everybody says we're going to die. Well, the story really didn't say that. The headline kind of alluded to that. And it's, it's just the unfortunate part of capitalism and making money in, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to this. I mean, I think, I think you're right. And we, try <laughs> to t we need to try to talk to all people. And we can use different words at times to do different things. I remember a conversation I was having with mayors. And I asked them, mm -hmm. when you're making your sustainability case, mm -hmm. especially to your underserved populations, how do you talk about sustainability when people have very pressing, much more immediate mm -hmm. challenges mm -hmm. in front of them? And they all said, well, we don't talk about sustainability. We talk about we'll do an energy audit and help you save money on your house. We'll plant trees and your street will be cooler. And, and we do it that way. And I agree with that. But I also have a problem with that. You know, if you go to the doctor and the doctor said, well, you know, I can't use the word diabetes because she's going to think mm. that's a political thing. That's ridiculous. OK, mm. at some level, it is ridiculous. I get it. And I acknowledge it, and that's one of the reasons why we've got our frame around the innovations and the ideas. But there's another part of it that's just absurd, that the science is what the science is. Would you go to your doctor and say, please don't use the word diabetes mm -hmm. when you tell me what my diagnosis is? Mm -hmm. And that puts people who are communicating in a very difficult space, mm -hmm. because you want to be honest. You want to bring them the facts. You want to tell the story in the straight way. But you also have to acknowledge we're in this very challenging environment. Well, and there's changed. no easy. Mm -hmm. There's no easy answer to this, but don't you see that that's... Listen, I've been having to deal with this for years now, so I know exactly what you're talking about. It is frustrating, there's no doubt, uh, but it is the reality. But, but I'll, I mean, I'll let, I'll let the farmer say, or uh, the councilwoman in Miami say sea level rise, and then in our copy, our script, we'll say climate change, mm -hmm. we'll say climate crisis. And, you know, it's a negotiation, so we'll have that. You know, we'll, <coughs> we'll, we'll feature, a re she was a Republican that believed that her constituents were going to suffer greatly because of this. And, and again, uh, the, the vocabulary isn't as important as the, the pain point there, I, I think, mm -hmm. and focusing on that pain point. Eugenia, I'll give you the last word here, since you worked at more networks than the rest of us. <laughs> and you've got your whole uh, beat now, which is remarkable and great and uh, very exciting. Do you think that <clears throat> this story, not as a story, but as, a, as, an, as, a, as an issue, that we tell through story mm -hmm. um, has legs, if we, as, we, as the term we use, or is this a, is this a moment? Is this a fad? Is this something that's that's mm -hmm. here now? Is, have we crossed a threshold mm -hmm. where there's yes. enough information and enough appetite that, like the national security beat that news organizations mm -hmm. have, like covering the White House, you gotta cover climate, and it ain't going away. Mm -hmm. One of our um, education partners, which is not as great as this university, 
<laughs> so don't name them. <laughs> Sorry. Can't make See, them she mind. knows her audience. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> knows wait, her wait. audience. That's why her ratings here are off the charts. <laughs> Drink with your branded mug. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, th they have received so much interest and information about it that they are literally in the process of considering um, an entire school dedicated oh. to climate change. Where is this? Um, I'll, I'll tell you when, I'll tell you off camera. No, no. <laughs> now we all want to work there. Well, I will tell you that Columbia University is building a climate college. That's building the one. Building. That's oh, no, the that's, one. That's, no, but that's common knowledge. I mean, they just, they just released some type of, um, uh, yeah, they just, they, they did the announce it. The university has a sustainability minor that has 300 students, uh, you know, minoring wow. in sustainability. And 300? Stuff. That's yes. fantastic. That's fantastic. And what I'm saying, uh, yeah, so the, the short answer to that is absolutely it has legs. I mean, I think we're, this is now an entity that is, is not just being studied, but it's being lived. It's being experienced by people, um, old and young, all races, um, all, the, all the genders and all areas on the, on the spectrum of gender. And, you know, it, it is, it is, it is real. It's here. It's not going to go away. We have to fix it. We have to solve it. It. I think that between nature and man-made genius, um, we have the solutions. We just have to be willing to do it. We just need the willingness to fix it, right? So we need to stop fighting or squabbling over terminology and just roll up our sleeves, make the decision that we are going to say we are united, Captain America. You know, we are united, Captain World or whoever. I don't follow Marvel, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> whoever the people are with the ring and everybody. Yeah. But 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 honestly, we need to we need to make the decision to save the planet because it's what we have. Life can be better than it is. I mean, we yeah. don't think about that. Life can be better. It can be better. We can have a better there life. Is, in the there future. is an incredibly optimistic story to be told here because mm -hmm. not very long, we actually had rivers on fire. Not very long, yeah. Los Angeles was totally choked in by smog or Santiago, Chile. Not very long ago, coal was burning in London and you could barely breathe, okay? We are capable of doing this. It is political will. We have the innovation. It's an exciting story. It's an incredible story. It needs to be told. You guys are doing an incredible, amazing job. So. Jeff and Eugenia and Jen, thank you so, so much for coming here. Um, go out, make noise, tell stories, <laughs> and don't end it. They'll, all happily, they'll live happily ever after. <laughs> it's a much more complicated story than that. So keep it going, keep them honest, and go, go, go. I want to thank our panel. I want to thank everybody here. I want to thank Climate Nexus for working with us at Planet Forward at the George Washington University and all of our consortium schools for this conversation. It's something that's very important. And for those of you who are reporters, for those of you who are communicators in whatever walk of life you, you pursue, I think there's some really important things to take away from this conversation about meeting people where they are, about recognizing the complexity of the story, <coughs> about finding the characters who are compelling and real, about making it relatable to people, about not giving up, about finding lots and lots of different angles and aspects because that's how you keep a story fresh and exciting and new. So thank you very much for joining us and go save the planet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.